Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Kate. How are you today? I'm very well. Lovely to meet you, Michael. Lovely to meet you. It's been a long time in the making, this interview. So thank you so much for your patience. But I have a feeling it's quite good timing now. <laughs> Completely. Well, the world always works in our favour. We might think it's procrastinating and dragging its heels, but it always happens at the right time. Yes, yes. Well, we'll get into the detail why it is good timing. Um, but yeah, I love having you on the podcast. I, I, I know you do some amazing things or have been doing amazing things in the world. And I... Yeah, I love your surname too. I don't know if it's a made-up surname. I want to hear about that too. <laughs> no, I was, I was born strong, Michael. <laughs> oh, yes. I was hoping for that. <laughs> I think it's amazing how people can live up to their surnames. So just for information and for the listeners, my surname is De Groot. Uh, the, the Dutch pronunciation is De Groot, which... My father, when we came to the UK from Amsterdam, my father said, right, before we go over, you all have to practice how to pronounce your surname. And we went, what are you talking about? Our surname is De Groot. No, they cannot say that in England. You have to change your surname to De Groot. And we were really disappointed. <laughs> but the literal translation, there's a two-way meaning for all the Dutch people listening. It's either the great or the not so the big <laughs> you live up to <laughs> uh, the great of course <laughs> right kate okay let's get going because i know there's a lot to share and um so tell us a little bit about your story and how did you get to where you are today God, I, I, it's such a it's such a great question. But where do you start? Where do I start? Yeah. Right. I mean, let's start with my name because everything has a you know the same one coin might on one side seem really great, like the name strong. It means you know I feel empowered, I feel invincible. If I'm being bullied, I can overcome it. But the other yes. side of the coin, uh, I did struggle a lot with vulnerability about expressing need for help, about letting people in because. I saw that as a sign of weakness. Yeah. So quite a lot of my youth, I was spent quite alone and in slight conflict, if you want, with myself, because I wanted to involve people, yet felt that that was against my name, against my nature. Right. Uh, so my, my journey, in it, if you want, in itself is to discover what the word strong means, because uh, it's yes. not always about force and power. It's also about vulnerability and acceptance. So um, that's just a little anecdote about my name. Oh, I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. My pleasure. Um, and yeah, I think how I became who I am today isn't from the world records or the medals. It's actually from the dark moments. It's from the failures. It's from the uh, mistakes. It's from when I've actually felt exposed and been uh, a, a, a abused, if you want for that word. So I think... I call it my conscious awakening happened about 10 years ago. And that's when I realized that I'd been drifting and letting the world do whatever it wanted on me. I yes. was no longer creating my life. I was no longer designing what I wanted or being responsible. So I couldn't be responsible for the bad, but I couldn't also own the good either. Right. Uh, and my wake up call was six days before my wedding when my partner of nine years left me. Uh, he didn't just leave me emotionally. He also emptied the bank account, left me running a business that I was struggling to understand if I could do alone. It was a hospitality company. And for the nine years, he'd kind of like whittled away my self-confidence. So this was, right. all, this was where I needed to own up either that I was going to be a victim of life for the rest of my life and things happened to me that I just needed to react to and survive or use that as a point of power and to really pivot into this new pathway that you're seeing me as now. And that's what I chose. I chose to own everything that happens to me, but also that meant taking responsibility for the lessons I needed to learn, but also start proactively creating a life that I, I would enjoy for one, but also could be proud of as well. But was that, I mean, 
in the moment of that happening, when, you know, he left you and everything else that happened as a consequence, in in that moment, because when something bad happens to us, you know, we kind of go, oh, you know, we're depressed, we'll cry, we'll moan, we'll do all of the things that we do as human beings, which is natural. We're emotional beings, aren't we? Mm. But when did you discover what you just said about you can change the way you reacted to it? And how did that come about, though? Yeah, it, great question. And it was it was months after that moment. You mm. know, the, I did suppress it and I complained about him to anybody who would listen. And even yes. if there was no one around, I'd still be complaining. And, and I turned to drink. I, I turned to alcohol to take the edge off it. Right. And I think it was four or five months after the non-wedding, it was yet another night, yet another extreme drinking session. And I just looked at the glass in front of me and thought, you know, how many more of these do I need to, to drink, to keep complaining about him? Mm. And there is nothing changing in my life. If anything, I'm becoming worse and yes. further away from that moment that I'm blaming. So I can't keep blaming this for the rest of my life or... or if I do, I'm going to become quite a bitter old woman. Uh, so it was it was just when I looked at this glass of wine and went, I need to start being responsible. And I'm going to start calling me what I am, which is drunk and not fit. Right. I either own what I am or I change it and, and own what I will become, which is I wanted to be fit and healthy. Yeah. But I was I was drunk and unfit. So, so it was, it was just a random night in a pub that I decided to make the change, but it wasn't, it wasn't an epiphany or anything. It was, it was just sort of an awareness and a realization that I was becoming someone I didn't want to be. Yeah. And it was your own realization. It wasn't the case of you've been reading books or listening to programs. It was just your own looking back at yourself in that glass and going, yeah, I've got to own this and this is who I am right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, 10 years prior, just as I'd met my ex, I was reading those books, those personal developments. Right. And started doing life coaching and a course. And uh, the words obviously were sitting in my mind because yes. we see them everywhere. We see the, the Insta quotes that remind us of positivity uh, and responsibility and all of the other good things. Yes. But I hadn't, I hadn't embraced it. It was still an out there thought process. Uh, so that moment was definitely created by me, but probably it was the 10 years of reading, even though they'd been like put on the shelf and created collecting dust, that slowly they were creeping in going, you know this, Kate, you've got this. Do something about it. 100%. I do believe that will have been your saviour because you put that into your subconscious and the subconscious came back and rescued you in some way um because i you know i know of stories where people are still in that place and they haven't rescued themselves so i was just curious to know how did it come about so i mean i don't know for sure but i'm just going mm, i would love for that to be true the true way that somehow things trickle back up into your mind and started knocking on that door <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I go, Kate, you know, remember these books? <laughs> yeah, I think I think we've all got that little voice inside of us. And I say little because it doesn't speak as loud as the logic. It doesn't speak as loud as the the addictions or the the wow or the the external voices that we sometimes hear. So that yeah. inner voice, that intuit, the you know, the the, the true path for us to be ourselves authentically, it's always present. The books yeah. help turn it up a little bit more and give me the framework to work within it. But yeah. if we sit down and listen, we know what we should be doing. You know, we know whether or not we should be with that partner or in that job or what changes we need to make. We just sometimes choose to tune it out. Yeah, 100%. Okay, so you looked in the glass, you got, you owned it, which is brilliant. I love the way you've expressed that. And what happened next? I publicly announced to my friends right there right then that I wanted to do a triathlon when I'd met my partner nine years ago I had just completed my first half Ironman which is uh 
do you want it in kilometers or in miles just to to check the distances i, I don't mind miles okay. <laughs> um, 1.2 mile swim a 56 mile bike ride followed by a half marathon 13.1 miles which is right. half a full iron man the distance is obviously double yes. and my intention 10 years prior was always to do a full one but my ex had convinced me to stop right and so in that moment when i knew that i wanted to make changes to keep me honest, if you want, to, to remind me that I had to I had to honour the truth. Yes. I needed a big goal to keep me accountable. And so I reverted back to triathlon. So mm. half, half drunk in a pub, I said, I'm going to do a triathlon, ladies. And I'm going to do an Ironman. And because I refuse to glass ceiling my potential anymore, I'm going to win it. I'm going to become number one in the world. Of which I was met with a bit of laughter but in honesty, I turned and said, no, genuinely, I will. But I start tomorrow because I still want to finish this class. So that's how it <laughs> <laughs> It was a good read. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. Oh, brilliant. I love it. Fantastic. That was a wow. That's talk about a big fat goal. That's a massive one, isn't it? <laughs> The bigger the goal, the scarier the goal, the less space we have to complain if the toilet seat up or if, you know, our inbox is full or if we're going to overthink our email responses or why so-and-so hasn't texted us. Those little details of life just have to go because yes. we have this mountain in front of us that is consuming us and we have to just think about that one path to get us to the top of it. Yeah, love that. Okay, continue. So yeah, so the next day I, I grab my trainers, I, I find them at the bottom of my uh, wardrobe, I dust them off, I, I put them on, fortunately they still fit, and I go for my first run. Now at this time I'm still working seven days a week because yeah. I'm paying off the debt and, and trying to run a business on zero uh, cash flow, uh, mm. so it's around five in the morning, and you know, buoyantly I jump down, run down the, the pathway, uh, and within a couple of hundred meters, I'm bent over, my legs are burning. I could feel the, the, the bile biting my throat. I'm about to, you know, pass out from the pain. Mm. And I can still see my house. That, you know, I could barely run for, too far away from, you know, the, down the road. Wow. But it started. I might yeah. have felt shock that I couldn't even run a mile. Yeah. But I knew that the path doesn't start easy. So yeah. over six weeks... Uh, obviously every day I turn up and I go for a little run and I can go a little further then a little further then a little easier then a little faster and before I knew it I could run up and down the road which was five kilometers without stopping and that's wow. when I knew there was nothing stopping me right <laughs> I, they do say there's um there's a chap that I read some years ago uh, Leo Babuta and he talks about changing habits or creating new habits and things. And he talks about the tiniest, tiniest, you know, goals that you start with. And I always remember this one story talks about running. And he said, if you want to start running, get up in the morning and get your trainers out of the cupboard. And that's all you do on day one. Yeah. <laughs> day two you take them downstairs and put them by the front door. <laughs> That's it. Day three, you put them on, step outside, and then come back in. <laughs> you, it's just like the tiniest micro kind of, you know, steps, I should say, not, not habits, little steps, the tiniest mm -hmm. little steps. And certainly it sounds like that's what you did. You did small steps and just added them on top of each other. And wow. Yeah, 100%. And if we think about whatever goal it is we're setting, uh, you know, I, I know I'm using sport, but the an analogy is everywhere in life. But if I wanted to do an Ironman, I, I finish with a marathon. If I thought about that marathon, I wouldn't have started. Yeah. But how many steps, as you said, how many steps is it involved to, to run a marathon? Well, let's just focus on the first one. Uh, and that's all we can do. So it, it, it allowed me to have joy throughout that path without the yeah. pressure of what was coming up. And that's yeah. all I wanted was to, to put something, you know, to have a reason to put a smile on my face through the day. Great, great. Okay, so you're doing all this running. How, where did it take you and how long did it take to get to do the triathlon? 
Well, I started, I suppose I started running, uh, l let's just say I started running in 2012, at the end of that year. Uh, I, I entered my first triathlon two months afterwards, just to, to reignite the passion of the three sports. Uh, and I finished it, which was great. Uh, and within nine months, so uh, in September of 2020, uh, sorry, 20, 2013, yes. I entered my first half Ironman. Right. So that was what I said, uh, what the distances I was. And it was my fourth ever race. And I was national champion. Uh, for the half, half one. The yeah. Half, yeah, brilliant. For my age group in Australia. So every single, just turning up every single day, doing my best. Yeah. And having the opportunity to race and having the dream that quite possibly I could run and finish it, but not yeah. be attached to that because I just wanted to be my best, not the best. Yeah. Uh, I became number one in the country for my age group. And well, that was that a surprise? Well, yes and no. Right. Because in life, I need to accept all possibilities, you know, the, the greatness and also the misery so that I'm never sort of disappointed. Uh, yeah. I'm allowing any opportunity to come through to me because I don't know what the future may hold. Um, and quite possibly, you know, for example, my ex leaving me was the greatest thing ever. But that's with retrospect. Yeah. Had I not accepted that, then it would have been the sort of undoing of me. So I needed to accept all possibilities. So I went to the start of that race thinking I might fall over and injure myself Yeah, to winning as well. So it wasn't a surprise, but it was because no yeah. one knew me. Uh, as I said, it was my fourth race. I wasn't even in a team. Uh, no. I didn't have a, I'd never met my coach before because she was just writing some programs on, on the computer for me. So I was definitely the underdog. But in my heart, I always knew that we've all got the potential for greatness. It was just at, in that day, it did mean that I was able to become national champion for my age group. Congratulations. Thank that's you. amazing. I love that story. Yeah, that's awesome. That's uh, fantastic. I mean, I think, you know, not knowing, because uh, lots of people, athletes that do races and things like that, they, you know, because they've been on a big coaching program or whatever. I mean, we've just had the um, Commonwealth Games, right? And people think, well, I have a chance of winning, but they don't really know. But to be, and they've been in, in that, you know, in their sport for a long time. So they know the ups and downs and the possibilities and their timing and everything else. But after four races to, to kind of go in and then, you know, be the champion or the top in your age group is it's, that's pretty remarkable. I would have, would have thought so. Yeah, it's well done. But yeah. Very uncommon. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. continue. I'm riveted. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that automatically qualified me for world championships. Uh, right. In, in long distance triathlon. Uh, because however hard I trained, I could never get further than 10th overall in Ironman. So I never qualified for world championships Ironman, which was my goal. Yeah. But they opened up the different possibility of racing. There are five different distances in triathlon. It opened up me racing world championships and the other distances. Right. Uh, and I didn't know how I could do that. It was in China. Um, I didn't know how I could get away from my work. Because, again, I'm working seven days a week in, the, in, a, in my business. I can't afford staff. I don't yes. know how I can afford to get to that country as well to compete. But when our why is strong enough, the how kind of sorts itself out. So because I was, you know, training with my heart and my um, local villagers of 2000 could see that, they all clubbed together. They, they, they crowdfunded money to pay for my flights. They organized a local hospitality school to send their students for work experience in my hotel when I was away. And that allowed me to focus on me going to world championships in China where, again, uh, I won it, which was a huge surprise to me. Uh, my parents came over to watch as well, and my mum kept saying, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. What does this mean? <laughs> uh, uh, and, yeah, it was, it was just a magical experience. But, again, it was that opportunity of being my best but not getting attached to the end result. I think that's the great 
it's a fine line to walk. Yes. You have to train to be number one without the ego of wanting number one. So it's slightly paradoxical as well. Yeah. I, I, yeah, because we, I, I don't, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because you have the wish and hope that you could be number one, but you don't want to be showing off like, well, you already said you were going to win it when you first set the goal, you know? So it's a strange one because if you think like athletes gone before, like, Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, you know, is it Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. Cassius Clay, you know, I'm the greatest, you know, and, and he had all that positive language that almost his language made him defeat his opponents and become number one in the world. So I've, I find it really, I'm, I find it a really difficult one, really. How do you overcome being conservative about your own ability, but still believing you're going to win it? it I don't know that answer with honesty, Michael, because mm. some days I get it right. Other days I, I struggle a lot and I can see it's not working. Mm. All, all I can do is make sure I don't self-diminish. Uh, you know, there's no point putting me down no. to make sure that I'm fulfilling that I'm not attached or egoic or putting others down as well so I keep my language clean I keep right. it also in reality as much as possible I knew I'd done my best I knew I trained to win it that was my times I'd set up a little vision board with the with the uh, with the how fast I needed a swim cycle and run in order to actually create a new record even for the for the race so I knew I trained with the mindset of a world champion so the reality, I just spoke about the language of the terrain, like the reality is I've trained to win this. I'm yes. in the best possible position. What happens on the day is in the hands of the triathlon gods. You know, I might yeah. have the race of my life and fulfill my prophecy or someone else will. And then I've fulfilled their prophecy. So I just need to then be in reality as much as possible, but not storytell. Don't put myself down. Don't egoically put big me up either. You know, we all are there. We all deserve to spot, to race. Uh, yeah. And now it's up to, you know, it's up to the day to prove who can cross the line first. And that might be chance as well. Yeah. And so what was that particular race? Was that the distance that you'd done before? I hadn't raced that one before. I'd raced, so it was, it's called long distance. So it's a 4K uh, swim 120 kilometer cycle and a 30 kilometer run so it's two-thirds Ironman if you want yeah um, so I'd raced an Ironman and a half but never the actual in the middle right uh, but yeah so um it was still quite new as well it was in very humid conditions in China uh, yes quite a hilly course as well and yeah people were struggling a lot with the heat yeah but fortunately kept having lived in Australia I was quite used to that bit and right. I was looking forward to it oh wow okay so how long did you live in australia for i i was living there uh, at the time so i've lived there for nine years so i actually raced for australia as well not britain right 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 but you were born in britain yeah yeah, born yeah. In britain. yeah okay right okay continue then <laughs> yeah so on the day as i said it was the an amazing race that I, I finished first and became world champion. But what I hadn't noticed, and I think you'll, this is where we learn the lessons. I'd sort of put it on a pedestal because where do we go once we've reached our goals? I know. I hadn't, I hadn't planned the next phase. I'd planned if I'd lost what to do, but I hadn't planned if I won. Right. And, and for me, I, I was also managed to successfully sell my business. So I was completely free. And, and I think I started to spiral. I didn't know who I was anymore because I was no longer owns my business. I'd reached my goal in triathlon. I didn't want to compete against people either anymore. I wanted to sort of compete against myself. And so I moved back to Britain and the only thing I could do was start at zero again. So I got a job as a toilet cleaner in a cafe on a zero hour contract. And so even though I've got a double masters in engineering, I didn't want to lean on my past. 
I just wanted right. to lean on being my best in that moment. And that was the only job I could get without a resume. So yes. I started two days a week working in a cafe, cleaning their bathrooms and, and building myself up slowly there. Wow. <laughs> I really did not expect that, Kate. <laughs> I really didn't expect that at all. Um, you are one brave lady to do that. And from where you've been um, and gosh, and I mean, did you go for other jobs other than that one? I I didn't. I, I think like my friends saw me as this champion, this untouchable, this person who had her life together. Yes. And I didn't feel it. I could not connect to that person. Uh, and so whenever I sort of tentatively reached out for some help from my friends, they were like, oh, you'll be fine. They yeah. dismissed my, my, you know, my, not out of malice, but they just sort of dismissed my cries for help. Right. And for days I'd find myself not leaving the house. When I meditated, I'd cry. Uh, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't know who I was or how I could get through that. Mm. When you, when you've been number one, if you're not number one, people are surprised. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it was only two races I won out of, a dozen it was just so happened to be a national and world championships so yeah I was really struggling with this identity of of always being a champion where I I felt a fraud and so that's how I I needed to start somewhere where I didn't feel fraudulent and fine I, I you know I, <laughs> I went quite extreme but as you notice I am quite an extreme individual anyway so yeah it was it was only there where I could start being proud and realize that whatever I did, I could be proud of. Whatever I did, I could also bring the mindset of a champion. And that might be cleaning bathrooms, that might be triathlon, that might be business. But I had to start somewhere. And that really kept my ego and my don't you know who I am in check. Because because I was at the lowest rung, if you want, uh, of society. Yes. yes. And by the way... Uh, I don't need to, uh, this is my ego speaking, I guess, but I, I do value people that clean toilets. I really do. And I always, you know, whether it's a person who's cleaning the bins on an airport or wherever you might be, if they're in near me, I always tell them they're doing a great job because without them, we'd have dirty bins overflowing. We'd have dirty toilets to go to. They're never the best anyway, are they? So, um, I it's mean, it's a thankless it, job. It is totally, but I, I can see now the way you've explained it, how it helped you get back to a, like a new foundation and then go right to the foundation of you and start building it back up, which I hope will come next. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Continue. Yeah. So, so that's how I that's how I built it was starting at zero and slowly building up. And mm. um, I do love big challenges put in in my life to keep, as I said, to hold me honest to myself. But yeah. I really didn't want to have a life like triathlon where I was compared against others every single time, or yeah. against my own personal best. And so that's what drew me to be to my world records. Uh, I was randomly looking through Guinness online and I noticed quite a few sporting records were held by men, but they weren't held by their female counterparts. And so I thought, well, what if I did one of those world records that a man holds that yet no female? Because I can also start talking about public, you know, positive representation, about yeah. making sure that we equalize the playing field for men and women in different diversities. And so I chose to attempt the furthest distance on a static bicycle in 24 hours and <laughs> as you do <laughs> and naively I thought because there was no records anything would do so I didn't really train I talked a lot but I didn't put the mileage behind there and so my first attempt was actually a failure I right. cycled 290 miles but Guinness said it wasn't far enough to deserve a record right so, even though I went through the pain of cycling for 24 hours, I didn't achieve a world record. And that was in 2017. So it's taken me four years to get over my pride, to get over my ego, to get over my potential failure. 
and also the memory memory of the physical pain uh, yes we attempt it and and that's what i did last year so in a in quite a public setting because I, I do want to keep the journey of success public because a lot of us just share about the medals but not about the shadow behind them yeah uh, I, I live streamed the entire event uh and i cycled for 24 hours and broke three world records the furthest distance in one 12 and 24 hours on a static bicycle <laughs> oh congratulations that's Thank brilliant you. oh awesome just want to give massive high fives to you <laughs> Oh, uh, incredible stuff. Well done, you. That's that's such great news. <laughs> and what sort of bike was it? It was a bike that I got from a charity in Ghana that's made 100% out of bamboo. So uh, oh. I was riding on that for, for the duration. No pun intended, but bamboo is very strong, of course. It is. <laughs> When I visited Hong Kong, I couldn't believe the first thing that I saw when I drove from the airport was houses, you know, being built, apartments being built and the scaffolding being bamboo. Mm -hmm. I went, oh, my God, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. And now we've got socks, we've got support clothing, we've got so it's so versatile and obviously bicycles. <laughs> I, I even have a um, a business card, one single business card made from bamboo. Um, mm -hmm. So I never need a business card again. You just put the business card over somebody's phone and they have all your details. And that's made from bamboo too. Amazing. Brilliant. Yes. Oh, wow. But how did you learn about the bike, the bamboo bike? I've never heard of. A bamboo bike before i'd seen them before on my travels right so I was traveling in, in in asia and uh predominantly that's where i saw them before uh, and i was looking for a, a, a some way to positively disrupt people's thought processes you know we're, right. we're in a world at the moment where we've been told on many occasions we're at a tipping point we are at the point of massive climate change due to our actions or inactions depending how you look at it yes um, I, I, i'm very much about positive change rather than shaming people into forcing change so i'm the carrot to the world rather than the stick um yes and to me bamboo represents that we can't just keep buying a bike and painting it green and calling it positive change we you know how could i deconstruct it to question every element, to make sure that what we're doing from the very first step, as we talked on from the beginning, is green to its truest sense, is as fair and as just as possible. So bamboo does that, it positively disrupts us using materials that can't be reused, materials that can't be regrown, things that need to be mined and taken out. Uh, bamboo is a giver backer if you want, you can, we can grow much of it and use it in many different formats. Yeah. So to me, a bamboo bike kind of speaks to that mindset that we need to bring things back to the beginning, not just part way and then add a bit of green and move it forward saying we've done our best. To me, the best starts at the very, very beginning of its construction and thought process. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, absolutely. And had you before you started, sorry, I'm a we before we record started the recording, I mentioned to you that I, I'm a cyclist, I'm a Dutchman, so I, I love cycling, you know, and the, I mean, I can't imagine what it must be like to cycle a bamboo bike. Is it really heavy? Is it, you know? It's about the same weight as a steel bike. Uh, right. I do. I mean, as I was going, as the records were a static bike for this challenge, it didn't really matter the weight for it. Oh, okay. But uh, the, the upcoming ones, it, to me, it does feel a little heavier because I use disc brakes. So it, it is quite a yes. sturdy bike, but you wouldn't really notice any difference apart no. from it being out of, when you clink it, it doesn't ting, it clunks like wood. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, great. I'd, I'd love to see what it looks like. So if, if you have any pictures anywhere on your website, I must check it out. Yeah, I'll send, I'll send you some after this and you can add it in, yeah. in the show notes. Wonderful. 
Well, that, that for me, I'm sure you're going to share more records, but for me, you've done it all. You know, what else is there to do, Kate? <laughs> well, funny you should say that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like life is like life is a constant evolution. And for me, you know, I'm 43 years old. I hope I've got many more years to, to give into this world. And I definitely plan to leave it with cuts, scars, bruises, stories, memories, <laughs> with a big <laughs> smile on my face so the yes. more the merrier bring it on uh, <laughs> and again my evolution is stepping away from competing against others competing against myself which is the yes. world records and now using the sport as a collaboration tool like how can I truly embrace us working together and yes. use sport as that force for good that we hear so often so next year um starting on world environment day which is the 5th of June I'm cycling on my bamboo bike 3,000 miles around the coastline of England, Scotland and Wales uh, over three months. I'm planning to do like 30 sustainability challenges from collecting wild seagrass and planting it to reforest our oceans, to beach cleanups, to visiting hemp farms, to, you know, as many random and curious uh, sustainability projects as possible. Uh, And it's called Challenge 3000, but it's a way of like, bringing community together and start taking positive action to make sure that we leave the world a better place, but we also feel good about it as well. Like we can make a change, but I think the change has to come from within and it's gotta be that carrot, as I, as I said earlier. How that did all of that come about? Where, where did the thought process even start with that? Well, it started under a tree in lockdown. Oh, I'm also planting 3,000 trees. I forgot about that bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I look at the detail. Um, yeah. yeah, it started sitting under a tree in lockdown with my partner, realising that the work I was doing wasn't giving me immense joy. There were, there were moments and flickers of happiness, but mm. not enough for me to keep sort of pursuing it for the next 10, 20 years. And so he just said to me, what do you want to do? And I just said, travel i'd love to you know cycle across america love to swim in the oceans i'd love to climb hills he said we'll just do that uh so i've pivoted away from the american cycle because i i'd like to sort of fly as little as possible so that's why i'm keeping it on the uk but he said do what makes your heart sing and the money will follow just focus on again on why you do what you do and how you'll how it will happen will always look after itself Yes. So that's how it was born. It's just me doing things that I love and sharing about it. So I'm very aware that I'm very privileged and grateful to have that in my life. It's taken a long time to get here. But Mm. yeah, so that's how it was born. Just do what I love. (laughs) And I guess it's just to challenge yourself again to see. And I mean, there will be a lot of pain involved, Kate, with that. 3,000 miles. Well, if you break it up over three months, it's 33 miles a day. That's it. Is that it? That's it. I know, because I thought the same, but the cycling is the smallest detail. For me, the challenge is finding 30 communities, connecting with them. And if you, you know, a lot of what I did in the past is, is all by me. I train by myself, I cycle by myself, I plan it by myself. I can't do this one by myself. So Mm. the challenge is actually, for me, the hardest thing is involving hundreds of strangers. Yes. To house me, to feed me, to help me do the projects, to to support me in other ways that I don't even know how yet. That's the challenge. The, The physical is actually the easy bit for me. Right. Got it. Got it. I get that now. Yeah, so it's a different type of challenge. It's Mm. not just about, there will be some physical element involved, surely, because it's every single day that similar distance (laughs) in order to get it done. But um, you've got to do a lot of activity every single day that is not related to the physical challenge of things. But there are other challenges involved and no doubt surprises that you will have to overcome. I would imagine. 100 percent. Yeah. I I can promise you there'll be a lot of tears. (laughs) And laughter. (laughs) But yeah. Yes. Well, I hope there's going to be a lot of laughter for that one. Yeah. And how do you even 
I mean, you don't have to give every single detail, but how do you even plan for something as big as that? Well, as you can see behind me, I've got a map of the UK. Yes. And I've just I've got paper stuck around it where I'm just drawing string and notes around. So right. when when someone on Instagram or LinkedIn reaches out to me saying, I'd love to meet you, then I would a name with a piece of string and I will visit them. Uh, so how I plan it is pretty <laughs> random, but I, I want it to be fun. I want it to be free. And it's it I don't have children myself, but I imagine it's something of similar. You you give birth to something that you have hope for, you have a certain framework that you'd love it to live within. But once of a certain age, you've got to let it go. So yes. I think my project sort of reached its to toddler, early going to school for its first time age, that now yes. is taking on a, a life of its own. All I need to do is just capture the information and make sure that, that it sits within the framework of my values. Oh, I like that analogy. That's great. Yeah. Putting it down to the kind of growing up as a little kid and mm -hmm. um, yeah, awesome. Okay. I don't ask what else. There's nothing else. Is there? <laughs> um, oh yes. I always say yes to too many things, but that's the biggie. Let's just keep it to that. You know, as similar to you, I'm sure you've got loads of side hustles like your, you know, I've got a podcast as well. That's keeping me busy writing mm. a book. Uh, yeah. Working on other projects to make sure that this has a legacy so working with a school to launch it in September as a 12-month curriculum for their children to learn about sustainability. But but all of nice. that sort of interwined into the Challenge 3000. Yeah. And, okay, so what about the Wales thing? That's part, that's training. So, yeah, you're right, in one month. I completely forgot. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> um, in one month's time, I'm cycling 600 miles with my partner who needs to learn to ask secondary questions before saying yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> miles around the circumference of Wales, raising money right. for a mental health charity over six days. Oh, what's the charity? It's called Big Moose. So it's a local charity in Cardiff that supports homeless uh, individuals as well as people struggling with mental health to get immediate access to support in in those moments of crisis oh fantastic oh that's homelessness has been you know that that sector of society i have a lot of empathy for i i i did a about three years of volunteering for crisis uk and i yeah my heart goes out to any people that are you know for whatever reason are no longer in their own house or property or anything like that and mental health is such a massive part of that mm. journey um so yeah well i i will definitely i mean i will everything is being promoted on here but i want to you know i will share a lot about the wales thing because that's coming up quite soon right in a month's time so yeah we'll do that for now and then the other one when it comes Start yeah. to get ready. We'll start promoting that one heavily as well. Um, yeah. How exciting. I mean, it's such it's it's wonderful to have things to look forward to things, isn't it? To have kind of go, oh, I'm going to be doing that, especially if you enjoy it and you feel like you're giving back, but you're also getting something out of it for yourself. Yeah, 100 percent. And we're relying on strangers. We're not taking a tent. We're not booking hotels. So we're, we're just relying on strangers to house and feed us as we cycle. Uh, the last day we've opened it up for others to join us on the cycle ride. So 70 kilometers or 20 or two kilometers. So we've yes. got a route mapped out for all those distances to be part of the tour. It's not the show and tell of Kate. It's, you know, it's all of us together. Uh, and we've got a little after party in the Big Moose Cafe afterwards as well with loads of prizes and raffles for companies who want to help support and raise more money for, for Big Moose as well. Oh, awesome. Awesome. How can people get involved then? Let's do the Wales things first. What what can they do? How can they get in touch with you? Sign up, go on the website, whatever. The, the best thing is, which has all these links, is on my website, which is katestrong.global slash tour de Wales. 
Um, right. There you can donate. There's a donate button straight to the charity, as well as booking part the ride and also the after party, which we've got uh, food and drink sponsors as well. So please come along. Please get involved either through donations or better still on your bike and with your dancing shoes as well. <laughs> And then how do people get involved with the, the what did you call it, 3,000? But what's the word before it? Challenge. Challenge 3,000, that's it. How can they get involved with that one? Yeah, it's the same website, katestrong.global. Either just connect, contact me directly or, again, there's a slash challenge 3,000. Right. Uh, and you can see how to get involved. But I'm, I'm looking for charities. I'm looking for companies community-led ventures, schools, any, any, anyone who wants to actively champion what they're doing as well, because this is the voice for them to share on our documentary as well, but, yeah. uh, or to support me as well, because I, I know I, I can't do this alone. And when you say documentary, are you, you, you're not, are you filming this, live streaming, and what, what's I, happening? I just I said yes to filming it, so I'm learning at the moment how to to make documentaries. So uh, I've bought a little GoPro. I've got a little bit of sponsorship money towards that, and yeah. the intention is to create a documentary around Challenge Three Thousand to share how we all can become more sustainable, either starting the journey or double downing and accelerating what we're already doing. But now's yeah. the time to keep asking, what else can I do? What extra one step can I keep taking? And hopefully this documentary will prove enough inspiration and also the how-to-ness of, of taking those steps. Yeah. So if you had, like, you you have these massive big goals. Um, I haven't met anybody that has these kind of goals, by the way, so I'm very honoured to have you on the podcast. <laughs> honoured to have you on to hear about these huge goals. And the ones that you did before are pretty huge too. <laughs> Um, if you had a magic wand and a big wish on top of everything else that you're doing, who would you like to hear about this specifically to give this real, you know, some some real big promotion? That's a great question. Um, for it to reach as many people as possible, who I would love to speak to is somebody like the BBC or Netflix or some large media outlet that that reaches millions of people yeah and we find a way to make sure this gets traction for long term it's not just the three months I'm on the bike it's how can we make this into a tv series where every episode for 10 years we don't listen to the you know the, the certain family members who are arguing but we're actually watching a different community in a different place and what are they doing and what we can learn from it. So, yeah, somebody like the BBC, if, if you're listening, guys, uh, give me a bell and uh, we can we can talk about uh, rights and promoting that. Yeah. And I mean, I think BBC would be great and Netflix might even be greater. Mm -hmm. Only. Oh, well, it depends. I don't know much about them um, because their reach is a bit further. I think, you know, I think we need to start collaborating and mm. that's the entire message. So we could have yes. it on. It does, it, again, it doesn't yes, have it to be the face of Kate, but if every week on us, when every Monday, we all know it's sustainability hour across every single channel and yes. every Monday night, every single family in the whole wide world watches sustainability actions and what we can do in our own local area. That's wow, the that is awesome. Yeah, that would be amazing. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. Plan. Wow. Ha ha ha. Sustainability hour. Yeah. Love it. Mm. Love it. That's definitely what's needed. I I was 2004. Uh, 2004 or five, I think it was. Um, there was. Oh, I forget what it was called now, but there was this American company 
who started this little documentary streaming channel thing where any, anybody could submit their little documentary. It was online, like a YouTube channel, but it was like tiny mini documentaries. It doesn't, no longer exists. But it, it, I decided to do one and I went into a little, I wanted to do a tiny little documentary, literally like seven minutes. That's all you were allowed to do. So I went into Birmingham to interview people about my idea at the time, which was called Global No Drive Day. So one month, this was 2004, Kate, mm. one day in the month for, for people, yeah, only one day in the month for people not to use their cars. And I literally just took strangers from the street and asked them about that idea. And they were so positive about it. Uh, I'll have to send you the video clip of it because it was really good fun. And there was this Irish, it was the rant St. Patrick's Day, and there was this Irish lady, I think she was Irish or Birmingham, I'm not sure, um, but she sang this little song for me as well. She might have been a bit, she, a few, she had a few bevies perhaps, but it was still really, really lovely. Um, but yeah, we've been you know, messing around with this whole sustainability and climate change and everything for, for so long. And why do we take so long to get things right, in your view? Well, if we if we look at it on a micro level, if we remove the nation, why do we always wait till our partner breaks up with us six days before the wedding? Yeah. Make act to take action when we know mm. it's not a very healthy relationship, when we know that this signs to say it's quite toxic and you know our day is due. Why do we wait till that cliff edge moment? I think it's yes. you know we inherently do it on an individual basis, let alone national. We're just magnifying it. Mm. We, you know, we don't usually act until it is a crisis because it takes energy. And we, you know, we look at, I'm uh, not sure about you in university or school, but how often did we wait till the night before an exam to start revising or write that paper? Yes. We naturally do this. It's unsurprising, but we just have to make sure we don't miss the deadline. Yeah, yeah. That's great advice. Okay, I've I've really enjoyed our conversation and really going to be following your progress with all these amazing challenges and promoting it for you. And let's see if we can get some amazing, you know, big TV organization that will be working with you on it as well. Mm -hmm. And I wish you such amazing success with all of it i have no doubt it will be successful just be safe please yeah. and um let's hope loads of people come and support you is there anything that i should have asked you that i didn't that you would like to share and uh, no i think you did amazingly because you remember things i forgot uh but I, I would like to ask you one thing michael sure would you like to come and join me on the bike ride next year for part of my tour and whereabouts do I need to be? Let me ask that question. Well, I'm cycling around the circumference of England, Scotland and Wales. So oh, fine. Anywhere you like. <laughs> anywhere I like. Um, so it's literally near the sea. You're going to be near the sea, basically. Yeah, so I chose the path that if we reach one and a half degrees temperature, most of where I'm going will be underwater, just to add a bit of significance to what I'm saying. Whoa. That just blow my mind. Mm. Yes. And I, actually, as we're speaking, recording, we are having another mini heat wave this week in the UK. I mean, to a certain degree, I'm celebrating it because at long last we're having a proper summer. But there is part of me that is in conflict with that. Yeah. Because I'm going, yeah, but it's for the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah. It's a really weird feeling. I don't know. We'd normally we'd go, oh, we've got to finally, in Britain, we've got a summer. We've been wishing for this all our lives. And then I'm going, yeah, but it's not good news, is it? It, it, it needs to be a wake-up call. Yeah. You know, we can have good weather. It, like, let's celebrate what it is because, it's, you know, I, I've struggled quite a bit with climate anxiety this year. Like, let's enjoy it. Mm. sure that we're protecting our neighbours because there are some countries like India 
birds are falling out of the sky because they're dying from the heat. Literally, oh literally, they're having to close certain areas because the birds are just falling out of the sky. You know, Australia is, um, they've already got um, some areas you can't live in, it's inhabitable. So they've already got Australian refugees from the climate. Uh, mm. struggling to find homes so we're blessed that we had a temperate climate but yeah let's let's celebrate it get our tan on like the good old brits that we are um mm. but also take it as a, as you said a wake-up call too because we do need to do something and pretty quickly yeah so the answer is yes i will come and join you Yay. somewhere and that will be like a mini challenge for me so yeah you don't have to build your bike let's just say that you don't have to make it a bamboo no any bike will do <laughs> i have a bike i've got a scott bike that i've had for yeah uh, since 2005 so, so so i've had a bike same bike for 17 years that i cycle on and yeah that would be a good challenge yeah for yeah. me yeah. I will share, I'll share the route and you can pick where you want to go. As yeah. I said, it's never too far. It's a, a leisurely pace. My legs will be like jelly. So I think you can pull me along anyway from the bike. Yes, uh, yes, it, yes. It's just for fun. And it's just to stay connected into the into the story. Yeah, well, thank you for the invitation. That's wonderful. I yeah. keep saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's quite exciting. I'm looking forward to it now. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Awesome, Kate. Um, so if there isn't anything else, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your story and all the amazing stories ahead of you too. And uh, please do keep in touch. Well, we will. Obviously, we will. And um, good luck with everything. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Really loved today. Thank you so much, Michael. You're welcome. Take care. Bye for now. Bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.